Hey everybody, this is a midterm exam review for uh, the branding course at Wade College. This is the summer 19 trimester, and I wanted to put together a quick recap of the nine written uh, essays on the exam and 55 multiple choice questions. So what I've done is I have pulled together PowerPoint slides from uh, all the different presentations from chapters 1 through 10 of the book Brand Aid by Brad Van Auken. And let us ju uh, jump in. So of the nine written questions, um, I will start the presentation by just addressing those. Uh, the first question, one of the first questions, not that this is necessarily in order, um, is a question about brand identity systems and standards, right? Which deals with the physical graphic design of brand identity, including uh, the brand's name, its logo, uh, the specific fonts, and maybe other like visual devices that it uses. And then also things like sound, jingles, other mnemonic devices, um, and then any other aspect of brand identity that um, you know, a brand tries to attach to itself. All of that is a component, are components of brand identity systems and standards. Um, from the pop quiz that we had at the beginning of the course, we talked about the idea of a commodity. So a commodity is just a uh, generic product category, right? Bananas are a commodity. Bottled water is a commodity. Um, be able to discuss a brand that really owns a commodity. And so the example that we always use in class is like Kleenex owning the idea of um, facial tissues or Q-tips owning the cotton swab commodity. Um, the other question that you'll want to know for multiple choice purposes is of the 25 top brands in 25 different product categories 100 years ago, how many of them are still category leaders today? And we talked about um, the big companies that Procter & Gamble owns and um, Unilever and things like that. And the answer is 20. 20 out of the 25 top brands from 100 years ago in 25 different categories are, are the top leaders today. So that's pretty amazing. Um, one of the first things that we talked about, and we talked about this concept uh, for a few weeks in the class, is the idea of brand equity which is the total commercial value of a brand. And it includes all of the associations, both positive and negative, that consumers have, uh, that consumers attach to a brand. Um, we talked about the example of Coca-Cola, right? If every uh, physical piece of property or inventory that Coca-Cola owned would burn to the ground, Coca-Cola would still be worth like $75 billion. That's its brand equity. It's the, it's the total commercial value of just sort of what the brand stands for in the minds of consumers. Um, in another chapter, we talked about research and the idea that researching our competition, data would come from many different places. And I'd make sure that I could give examples of where that data would come from. Um, the obvious answers would be things like just looking at a, com uh, a competitor's website, uh, researching their press releases to see information like uh, new product launches. But then there's also company databases like hoovers.com. Um, there are database search ser services like LexisNexis. Um, and then we also talked about like ratings, uh, primary ratings companies like AC Nielsen um, that might provide a glimpse into uh, for especially private companies that don't have to publish a lot of this information. Um, those would be great resources for uh, the research on brands. Um, not to be confused with brand identity systems and standards, we talked also about brand design. So brand design addresses literally identifying a brand's target audience and then putting together a brand essence statement, a brand promise, and a brand personality profile. Okay, and I'll just take you through each of those quickly. So obviously a target audience addresses the, the target consumer's age bracket, income bracket. Uh, it could be things like their social class, their 
lifestyle, their beliefs, their values, their attitudes. So it's a profile um, that gives ranges as to who the consumer is. Brand essence is a short sort of statement of adjective, adjective, noun that sort of describes the heart and soul of what the brand is supposed to stand for in the minds of the target audience. The brand promise kind of gives the differentiating benefit. So only such and such brand can deliver what? What does that brand own in terms of a differentiated benefit? Only the Nature Conservancy delivers what? So they deliver kind of the same message that PETA delivers. They kind of do the same work that PETA delivers, but in a uh, in a way that is a lot less um, confrontational and um, controversial. Okay, so that's brand promise. And then brand personality is the idea that if a brand were a person, what would the human-like characteristics that that brand uh, might stand for, okay? So we think about this in terms of like describing a person, even though the brand, you know, is likely not a person. The next thing we talked about uh, in the course was brand architecture. So all of the uh, sub-brands that a parent brand might own and manage, and then how those sub-brands relate to the parent brand, okay? Another, another word to describe this is brand architecture. Uh, you can call it brand structure, brand hierarchy. All of these terms mean essentially the same thing. And it's just that a parent brand is going to own and manage many sub-brands. Um, and sometimes it will do it by using that brand name um, across all of its products. So we look at a brand like Microsoft all of its sub-brands are still Microsoft. Um, and then there are other concepts like the, the idea of endorsed brands, um, whereas Marriott, many of Marriott's sub-brands um, don't use Marriott sort of at the top of the brand name. Instead, it endor Marriott endorses the brand. So for example, Residence Inn by Marriott, Courtyard by Marriott, Fairfield Inn by Marriott. Those are endorsed brands, okay? Um, one of the topics that we talked about uh, via YouTube during one of my YouTube lectures was the idea of getting the consumer to go from uh, rough brand awareness to brand insistence, right? The idea of like brand loyalty. And there are five kind of steps to get the consumer to go from the most rudimentary brand awareness to the ideal brand insistence. Um, and the first step obviously is awareness, right? It's just the kind of the first brand that comes to your mind or being able to identify uh, the brand in a category. Um, other steps include accessibility, which is knowing where to access the brand, where to buy the product or service. Um, value, which has to do with um, attaching, you know, the worth of the brand's product or service to its price. Uh, relevant differentiation, meaning, again, knowing what the benefit um, attached to the brand is, what it does differently or better. And then kind of the top of the pinnacle is emotional connection. And in a nutshell, that's just feeling a certain way about a brand, um, hopefully attaching a positive emotion. Um, and the best example of a positive emotion that we can have about a brand is trust. So it might be trust, it might be nostalgia, it might be satisfaction, it might be that we have other sort of like um, self-defining uh, emotions, meaning that the brand kind of helps represent kind of what we want to stand for in life, in society, in groups. Anyway, so once there is an emotional connection between the consumer and the brand, then the brand has achieved brand insistence, brand loyalty, okay? Next, we talked about different types of brand names, and there are three kinds of brand names, generic, associative, descriptive, and coined. And here, I just wanna talk about coined, and we'll talk about the other ones later. But a coined brand name is basically a brand name that is made up, so it's an original word, it's not a word that you can find in the English dictionary, and these are all examples of those, Duracell, Kleenex, Kodak, Tylenol, Advil. Um, these are all words that are not really English words. 
And companies have to invest a ton of money into giving these words meaning by doing considerable amounts of advertising and then other forms of marketing like public relations and social media um, and direct marketing. Um, so it's probably the most expensive kind of brand name because it has, you know, companies have to invest a ton of resources in actually building the, uh, the meaning. And honestly, it really is one of the best kinds of brand names because it is easy to truly own from both a copyright perspective, but also just from a consumer image perspective. Um, it just requires an investment of, of, of uh, money and energy over time, okay? Um, the last couple of questions, uh, written questions on the exam, have to do first with media planning. And I'll go over all of these now. There'll be multiple, multiple choice questions about the concept of media planning, media buying and planning. Um, and there is also one written question. So, first of all, the job of a media planner is um, to both purchase the media, uh, and, and media refers obviously to um, print advertising, broadcast advertising, digital advertising, um, and then also to plan out when the advertising will appear in the specific media. So that could include which months of the year, uh, which literally times of the day, which times of the week, um, you know, where, wh it, during what parts of TV shows do we want our broadcast advertising to be adjacent to, what types of websites do we want our, our uh, digital media to appear on, etc. Okay? And part of their job is to work with the four metrics that we talked about, reach, frequency, impressions, and CPM. So I'll start with the word impressions, and impressions is just the total number of people that are going to see an ad, okay? So the more people that watch a TV show, the more people that read a magazine, the more people that drive by a billboard, impressions increase. Frequency is the number of times that an individual is going to be exposed to the advertising. And we said that advertising is truly a game of frequency. People need to be able to see an ad, be exposed to an ad multiple times, as many as seven times, in order for that ad to be successful, in order for that ad to generate some type of or achieve some type of call to action. Reach is the percent of the total number of possible people that can see an ad, um, that are going to see the ad. So another way to describe it is it's the percent of the target audience that the ad is going to be exposed to, okay? And so lots of advertising novices make the mistake of trying to get their ad in front of as many possible people um, as possible when really you'd be better off spending your money uh, serving your ad to fewer people but more times, okay? So it's a, a game of frequency, not reach. Finally, CPM is cost per, and the M is actually meal, which is Latin for thousand. So CPM is cost per thousand. This is a way, it's a mathematical formula, it's a way for us to convert the cost of reaching every 1,000 people regardless of what type of advertising media we're talking about. So we could be looking at a billboard that might expose an ad to 30,000 people, and we might be comparing that to you know, a social media post that might reach only 5,000 people. But we need to be able to compare apples to apples. And so we wanna look for, at all the media um, to see for every 1,000 people that an ad reaches, how much does that cost, okay? So a typical example of a cost per thousand could be something like $10 or $15 or $20, okay? CPM, cost per mil, and mil is thousand in Latin. So it's the cost for reaching 1,000 people through a specific medium. Okay, the last uh, of, of nine written questions is going to ask you about um, a non-advertising uh, I guess, uh, approach, okay? And so we talked about lots of different creative, um, less expensive, non-advertising, we can call this guerrilla marketing, we can call some of this 
direct marketing, um, but you know, and some of these are truly stunts. Some of the examples we gave in, in class are, you know, technically would fall under vandalism. Um, but these are things that are not advertising. So they're not paid media space, but they still accomplish, um, you know, a, a branding. They're a branding effort. Um, the example we're looking at here is Minnie Cooper having discarded these giant boxes um, on the day after Christmas in major cities to make it look like lots of people had received a Mini Cooper as a, as a present, okay? And so that would be considered like a guerrilla marketing tactic, not paid advertising, because this is obviously not paid media, um, but it generated a ton of buzz from social media and also from uh, things like me actual media coverage, okay? Um, okay, now we get into the kind of multiple choice portion of the exam, 55 multiple choice questions. Um, and I'll just go through these relatively quickly, okay? So from Appendix C, we talked about, again, the 25 brands still in existence today, and there's 20 out of 25 brands. Um, and then examples of ingredient branding, where we use the brand name as sort of like an, uh, a generic ingredient word. Um, Jello is a great example of that, right? We, we always say uh, we use, we call any form of generic gelatin Jello. Um, that's an example of ingredient branding. Um, a fabric example would be things like spandex, lycra, Gore-Tex. Those are all brand names. They're, they don't actually refer to um, the, the, the physical raw material. Okay, make sure you know obviously what a brand is and how to define the word brand. Um, there's a bunch of ways to define the word brand. It's the source of a relationship, the source of a product, the unique source of a product or service, etc. Brand positioning is the way that one brand is perceived against other brands in a competitive set. We talked about Barney's versus Neiman's, truly really, you know, being the same type of retailer, but just being, you know, positioning themselves very, very differently in terms of image. Brand essence, again, the heart and soul of a brand, usually stated in just a couple of words, three words, um, adjective, adjective, noun. Brand personality, again, the human-like characteristics of a brand. Brand portfolio, all of the brands and sub-brands owned by one parent corporation. Brand extension, the idea of a brand operating in a new product category or a new service category. Um, hopefully that brand extension makes sense and the consumer has sort of given permission to the brand to operate in that new category because it stands for something that you know the consumer would, um, would transfer to another category, okay? We talked about the idea of the total brand experience, and one example we used was vitamin water and their pop-up shops, really giving the consumer the opportunity to experience the brand and learn about the products in an environment that they can control far better than, let's say, a grocery store shelf. We talked about market segmentation, the idea of really picking a market segment, um, a, a sub population that has very specific homogenous needs, right? Um, and the group has to be large enough um, for it to be a viable audience, but the group should be similar enough, homogenous enough that we can make general stereotypes, gross generalizations about that, about that audience. Um, generally, a market segment is the same age bracket, the same income bracket, uh, they may be the same race, they may have the same types of occupations, they're white collar versus blue collar, they're urban versus suburban. So they have a lot of specific demographic, psychographics, and geographics in common. Okay, we talked also about um, psychographics and an example of one way to measure, to define a consumer psychographics is through the VAL system. VAL stands for Values, Attitudes, and Lifestyle. And um, it's a lifestyle segmentation or psychographic segmentation device. And we talked about the difference between the way VAL sets up like innovators versus survivors. And it's just two different ways that consumer groups maybe view the world. Um, and this would affect the way that maybe you would run an ad and the type of um, photography and the type of verbiage that you would use um, just from two different perspectives of how two different audiences view the world. 
We talked about competitive frames of reference, so the way a brand defines itself, it should never be so narrow that um, a brand cannot extend to other products or services. Um, some examples that we used was um, Cirque du Soleil defining itself as really like, it, 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 it uh, competes against every other form of entertainment. It's not just a circus, it's not just a, uh, a Broadway style show, it is it literally, it's all forms of entertainment. Um, another example we used was Coca-Cola, right? Not just competing against soft drinks, but competing against even like all forms of psychological refreshment. And, he, and kind of here's that example there, okay? Again, we talked about competitive frames of, uh, 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 or sources of competitive information. And so just make sure that you know um, that like Hoover's is an example of a company database, LexisNexis is an example of a database search service. Um, there's also AC Nielsen, which is a example of, um, which is an example of ratings for primary ratings, okay? You'll remember in class that we did a brand essence exercise where each uh, group was given a celebrity or famous person and the uh, point was to write a brand essence statement, adjective, adjective, noun, that would ring true for the larger audience. And all of you did a really good job um, kind of writing these brand essence statements for um, different celebrities, politicians, etc. okay? Again, brand promise is the differentiated benefit. Only a brand can do what? What is the benefit? The benefit can be functional, meaning that the product or service does something. It could be experiential, it could be emotional, or it could be self-expressive. The brand helps the consumer express kind of who they are, what they stand for, what their lifestyle is, etc. Um, repositioning a brand, the idea of um, getting the consumer to unlearn something about the existing brand and to attach brand new, uh, you know, brand new feelings about the brand to it. It's a very challenging thing for a brand to do successfully. Okay, we took looked at two different branding models. The traditional branding model where um, an individual corporation, parent corporation, manages lots of standalone brands where each brand has its own image and its own kind of, um, you know, brand essence, brand personality, uh, brand promise. The modern branding model, which is not here, um, is where, you know, one brand uses its name and its image across lots of different product categories. So make sure you know the difference. Traditional, manage lots of standalone brands and modern is you know managing one brand across lots of product categories okay again with brand naming we talked about the idea of coined brand names which are made up associative descriptive brand names which describe something about about the brand usually it describes the benefit best buy right sort of hints at the fact that it's maybe the best priced um, which maybe is or is not the truth. Swiffer and Sir Speedy and Roadrunner and Sprint are all something about them is fast, right? Those are all brand names that, that suggest fast, okay? We talked about the emotional impact of color. Um, this was a piece of the lecture um, about sort of like logo design. And we went through all examples of colors, you know, doing things like helping us retain or helping us learn things. Colors can also do things like have a calming influence. Um, color can stimulate our appetite, which is why fast food companies always use warm colors like red, orange, and yellow in their brands. So color can have all types of emotional and mental impacts on us. Okay. We talked also about the idea of consumers not truly being price sensitive within reference zones, price reference zones. Um, so a consumer will be price sensitive if you present them a price outside of their reference zone. Um, actually, Netflix once again is seeing declines in uh, subscribership for the first time in a long time. Um, actually, since the story I told you guys about a while ago, um, when they uh, increase their, their price by a dollar. But the trick with brands is for them to truly figure out what their reference zones are, and then to be able to price their product at the very top of whatever that reference zone is, okay? 
um, be sure to review price segmentation examples so we can segment products, the same product, the same exact service to very different audiences by segmenting prices. And the easiest example would be, you know, the same exact hotel room at a peak time um, versus an off peak time is going to attract two very different audiences. Just like first class and coach are two very different audiences. Just like, you know, front row orchestra and nosebleed mezzanine are gonna be two very different audiences. Again, these are the same airlines, the same musical artists, the same hotel, but because of such different price segmentation, the marketing to different audiences is going to be obviously markedly different. Okay, again, emotional connection. We talked about the feelings that brands want to get consumers to attach to their brands with trust being probably the most important feeling. Um, in terms of advertising, we talked about brands really needing to aim to spend about around 6% of their net income on advertising. And then more than that, if they're launching either a new brand, a new product, if their product is really complicated and advertising has to really focus on educating the consumer about what the product is, and then if the price is a premium, if, if the product is a luxury product, then generally speaking, consumer uh, companies are gonna have to spend more time getting the consumer to associate these feelings of um, luxury with the product or the brand, okay? Again, there'll be multiple choice questions on media planning. So just to go quickly from top to bottom, reach the percent of target audience, frequency, the number of times the audience will see the message, impressions, the total number of individuals that will see the message, and CPM cost per thousand, the cost per reaching every 1,000 people uh, via a specific advertising medium. Okay, advertising is definitely one of the most important elements of branding. Um, we definitely said that this course is not an advertising course, but advertising is definitely an important piece of it. But there are other ways um, that are sometimes just as effective and certainly cheaper. And we talked about things that are examples of guerrilla marketing. Um, we talked about flash mobs. Um, so just make sure you know an example um, of advertising versus non-advertising versus marketing that is not paid media space, be it public relations, be it direct marketing, um, be it guerrilla marketing, etc. Okay, and that is everything. That is the midterm exam in a nutshell. Um, nine short answer, short essay style questions and um, 55 multiple choice questions. All right, I will see you guys next week and please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about anything I've covered. Um, if you need help with anything, if you need clarifications, I'm always happy to help. Um, give me an email, give me a call, Jupiter message me, however you wanna to get to me and I will respond. Thanks so much everybody, bye.